Okay. I don't know if we're getting v video. Ah, okay. Oh, great. Okay, great. So this is a bit of a continuation from the previous session where we mentioned the fact that we're providing pervasive common APIs across all of our platforms. So again, that will be for you know, the Catalyst as well as the Nexus and the, uh, the ASR, ISR sort of products across our enterprise data center as well as our service provider offers. So we're really being serious about providing common APIs, consistent APIs for being able to essentially do device manageability um, through very user-friendly interfaces going forward. Uh, and this would be kind of our next generation of interface to the device and no longer just being dependent on CLI-based scripting to the device going forward. So this is really kind of the future-looking view as to where we want to take device APIs and device, inter uh, device interfaces into the future. Um, uh, just in terms of the agenda, and I've actually, so I'm Christine Bacon, uh, I'm the Senior Director of Product Management in the Enterprise Networking Space. I'm responsible for SDN as well as our common uh, core software uh, features across our devices. Uh, and Peter Van Horn is our Principal Engineer in our core software group. Uh, that's responsible. Uh, the, a core software group is responsible for all the operating systems across all of our entire portfolio of um, Cisco switching and routing products. Okay, so in terms of the agenda, we're going to speak to you a bit about really how we're evolving device programmability. So again, I think a lot of people are very familiar, I mean all of you here are very familiar with CLI on the device, and that's really been the, you know, the go-to tool for being able to really interact with the device, whatever you want to do, configure the device or be able to get statistics from the device, being able to really understand what's happening on the device, that's really where you go, is really the CLI. And going into the future, as we really go into a digital uh, technology enterprise where we're going to really see hyperscale needs in terms of being able to you know, really automate and manage the network uh, where you know, there are lots of devices on the network, lots of users on the network, there's cloud-based workloads, there's on-premise workloads. We're really saying that we need to be able to provide interfaces that scale for the network administrators and need to be able to really understand uh, how to manage the entire network, not just device at a time. And so these are really the interfaces that we are looking to provide going into the future so that the network administrators are able to scale in the way that they manage these, you know, these hyper um, uh, load uh, level environments um, going into the future. Uh, and uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about, again, how we're um, looking to provide these APIs across the platforms, again, in terms of the Catalyst, the ISR, ASR families, uh, as well as the Nexus portfolio, um, and some of the sample features that we're going to go ahead and, um, and provide interfaces for. So you get a taste as to what those interfaces will look like. What do we mean by the REST interfaces? What do we mean by the NetConf interfaces? And in the previous session, we mentioned that we're providing Yang models. What do those Yang models look like? Um, and they're very you know, user-friendly um, interfaces as well as model definitions. We want to show you what those are so you get a sense as to the fact that this isn't a scary new frontier. This is really truly a friendly new frontier for um, our network administrators that are um, managing um, you know, enterprise networks based on Cisco technology. Uh, and then I'll, we'll also show you a demo as well so you get to see what it looks like on a real device. Uh, so again, uh, you know, this is just coming back to where we are from our network programmability strategy from Cisco perspective. What we are doing is really making sure that we have well-defined, consistent, and open APIs across our portfolio. So whether it's controller-based interfaces, as well as device-based interfaces. This is our comprehensive strategy for network programmability. We want to provide open, well-accepted APIs and interfaces across our portfolio that are consistent and uh, comprehensive. So you don't have to worry about APIs being different from one device to the next going forward into the future. Um, just like we mentioned in the um, previous panel, uh, really the networking industry is rapidly changing. We're seeing a lot of this trend really um, you know, being sparked by the service provider space. So the service providers have really been in, you know, in high pressure you know, environments as 
the explosive growth of mobile computing has really required the service providers to provide you know, highly scalable networks and highly scalable service provisioning. You can't just you know, have somebody call and say, hey, I want a new you know, uh, mobile you know, uh, network plan and be able to go ahead and take a request and uh, you know, be able to provision that in, in like an old world uh, provisioning type of an environment. You need to be able to do this in a rapid, you know, hyperscale type of an environment. So service providers are really pushing the, you know, the, the, the frontier in terms of being able to push the limits of what we could do in terms of providing that reactivity and that manageability, that provisioning, the configuration scale, um, that some of these you know, large-scale enterprises such as the service providers are demanding and needing. Um, so as part of this business need, what we're seeing is that the service providers have really understood the fact that, look, we need to be model-driven in terms of how we interact with our resources on the network. So it's not just about like the database resources or the VMs. Even on the network side, we need to make sure that we could go ahead and really provision the network just like anything else. We can't just go by CLI by an individual device at a time. We need to be able to go ahead and configure these devices on the network through really kind of a set of prescriptive um, uh, uh, requirements. If I have um, services that I'm provisioning or I'm providing through a service catalog mechanism, I need to then be able to go ahead and flow those requirements down to the device and be able to ask for device provisioning through these interfaces that are model driven. And those are really things that we're seeing in the service provider space today. Uh, and there's a lot of momentum, I would say even in the last two, three years, where the standards bodies like ITF, um, Etsy, as well as even um, some of the customer-driven forums, um, such as Open Config, these various different um, uh, communities are really pushing the um, definition and evolution of these uh, uh, um, device models and networking service models uh, going into the future. And we're seeing that our customers today, both service provider customers as well as these large-scale enterprise customers such as financials or the massively scalable data center uh, customers that are really large, large-scale enterprises. Uh, these customers are asking for really, you know, these standards-based interfaces, NetConf interfaces, uh, REST interfaces based on model-driven um, uh, capabilities on the device. And again, uh, as a result of all of these things that we're seeing in the industry, as well as the direct feedback we're getting from customers, we're moving to really um, provide complete data, data model-driven interfaces across our platforms. So um, just in terms of what we're doing uh, from a very high-level architecture perspective, what we're realizing is that there are systems above the network device. It's not just the, you know, the manual um, administrator that's managing the device anymore. It's all going to be automated, whether it's through applications, through orchestration systems or controllers. And what we're seeing is really, you know, these are applications that are developed by some developer at the end of the day. And those developer, um, um, you know, app developer um, built applications are going to need these interfaces, REST interfaces, NetConf interfaces from the device. And we provide a model-driven agent layer, and Peter will talk a little bit more about this as part of his presentation. We provide really a consistent interface on top of our devices that are model-based. And today, you could go ahead and go directly to our software stack, our core operating system, through this model-driven layer and be able to go and configure BGP or OSPF or be able to go in and configure you know, a VPN, uh, et cetera, and, and essentially abstract the details of what we do today in the networking operating system through these model-driven interfaces. And they're very user-friendly. We'll show you some examples of what that looks like. What we're doing as we move forward into the future is that you know, we have multiple different platforms today. We want, our goal is to make them consist consistent. All the models on our platforms need to be consistent. That's our goal. 
Uh, and in order for us to do that, we um, want to not just build Cisco-centric models, we're working with the industry, so that we, and as well as customer-driven forums, so that we're understanding what the model definitions are that customers want, um, or the standards bodies are defining, and we're really going to evolve our own uh, model-driven interfaces, or build new model-driven interfaces if we need to, in order for us to be able to uh, uh, be uh, consistent with, with the standards uh, that are being developed in the industry. So, structured data for uh, management interfaces. What does this mean? Well, what we're saying is, look, APIs, as we go into the future, APIs aren't just going to be just another way for you to interface with the device. It's not just a CLI replacement. What we're really seeing is that in the next few years, let's say five to 10 years, we're really going to see hyperscale level of computing across all company, uh, all, across all sorts of enterprise uh, IT environments. And these are realities that our enterprise customers are facing today. They're realizing that, you know, all of you guys sitting here today, if you guys are part of an IT organization, you guys are challenged with the fact that you guys have lots of end users are bringing their own devices. You have, you know, uh, VM explosion on your network where you guys are seeing that um, lots of different, you know, uh, business units are building their own environments, needing their own VMs to go ahead and be spawned or brought down. You're seeing lots Lots of mobility needs. You're seeing also lots of cloud-based uh, workload needs where you have to provide really connectivity out to the cloud that's in a secure way. All of these things you can't do manually going forward and you can't configure all of those kind of you know parameters such as policy parameters, ACL parameters manually or even just through your own own um, homegrown tooling. What we're, what we're really seeing is that as, as really um, the enterprises are hit more with a demand of you know, hyperscale computing um, across the enterprise. We're w wanting to provide really the readiness in terms of how our devices could scale uh, to support your needs in the way that you could go out and provide manageability of your own network as you go, in, you know, five, ten years down the road as, again, the, the, um, the usage of the network becomes more complex and much more, um, much more um, again, exploded in terms of the needs on the network and the demands on the network. So those are the type of APIs that we're wanting to provide. We want to provide highly scalable APIs that are consistent, that you could go ahead and essentially write a single uh, you know, tool to be able to go ahead and manage across all of our all of our APIs, all of our devices going into the future, into the future, and um, Yang model again is a modeling language that is being um, developed out of the standards bodies, uh, and also with customers. There's a lot of work that's happening in terms of the Yang model definitions in the industry. Again, Peter could tell you more about what Yang is as well as what it looks like. Because again, it's not some new scary thing. It's actually a very uh, intuitive way to understand the, the features and the capabilities on the device. Uh, and again, we will be providing NetConf REST interfaces based on these Yang models going forward. Timeline-wise, um, we have iOS XZ platforms, which are really the, the you know the predominantly adopted set of platforms, um, you know that basically power our ISR, ASR, the Catalyst uh, switches, um, and you know it's the it's the the biggest. Uh, uh, install base, uh, I would say, of um, platforms that our customers use today. Our uh, Catalyst ISR, ASR platforms will start to provide these interfaces starting this year. So in November of this year, uh, we're going to be providing a production level release of the um, uh, of these XSEED based devices that are going to be based on these uh, Yang models and um, NetConf REST interfaces. Here's a little bit of a view as to the platform coverage um, in terms of not just the XC devices that I mentioned, but NXOS as well as iOS XR devices that will be based on um, Yang model definitions as well as the REST NetComp interfaces. So again, this is the way that we're going into the future in terms of providing comprehensive uh, capabilities on the device through developer and user-friendly interfaces that are REST and NetConf interfaces going into the future.
And this is again getting ready for the next five year, ten years of you know what what we see as being the load and the need for managing um, uh, at a very high scale uh, level of operation in terms of managing your networks going into the future. So in terms of what I just said in the November release, we will be providing these uh, interfaces that are NetConf um, and, and REST-based interfaces on our XE-based platforms. The, um, the release will be the 3.17 release. And so some of the features, I, I, you know, for those of you who are the CCIEs, you'll be able to recognize a lot of these kind of capabilities. You know, we have re interface uh, 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 the APIs, as well as the policy APIs, the ACL API, BGP API, RIB, the VXLAN, VLANs. I mean, these are really, you know, the fundamental kind of table stakes kind of uh, APIs that we see most of our customers um, needing to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, access to uh, from the device, as well as our own applications that we're building, such as our SDN controllers, or orchestration systems, as well as partner built products. So these are some of the, um, uh, again, you know, fundamental set of APIs that we're going to be uh, we're going to be providing day one uh, across our XE platforms um, by the end of this year, by the November timeframe. Um, and uh, as you can see on to the right hand side, uh, we will be providing lots, lots of interfaces that are quite rich in terms of being able to um, uh, uh, access and be able to configure on the device uh, going into the future. So some of the things that you would even recognize, you know, we have Sourcefire and Skywarp and Snort. Snort is an open source um, uh, security tool that, um, that we also have running on our XC devices and uh, we will be providing uh, model-driven APIs to be able to go ahead and access and configure even those kind of capabilities on our devices. And it really goes to show that no other vendor in the industry could provide capabilities like this uh, from Cisco where we're providing really the richness from the boxes. We have lots of features in the boxes. Not, um, you know, not all, the, all, all of our customers have been able to really access um, these features because it's really hard to know how to configure and get access to these capabilities. We're really looking to break that barrier and provide really friendly interfaces to the device where you could truly be able, where you're truly able to access all of these features as well as automate uh, across the devices um, through these interfaces. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Peter, and okay. for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, he will go ahead and provide you kind of a, an in-depth view of what we provide on our devices in terms of the XC platform. Um, uh, I think it's an ISR, ASR based demo, and we'll show you what the REST interfaces, the NetConf interfaces, and the Yang models look like. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one slide to start with, and then I was going to start into a demo. Uh, First of all, we're exposing a NetConf 1.1 compliant interface from our iOS XE devices. And among the properties of 1.1 compliant interface are transactional behavior and rollback. And those of you familiar with how iOS products work today, they're not transactional. There's no automated rollback. That is a property of both the NetConf and REST interfaces I will show you. But also what's interesting is because we're exposing these standards-based interfaces, there are a number of open source tools available that will allow you to create language bindings on top of, in particular, the REST interface. And I'll show you here in the demo just some examples of some of the language bindings that you can now use in your application programs because we're exposing a, a standards-based interface. We're using Yang data models to describe both the syntax uh, the, and the structure of all the messages that are sent either to or from the NetConf interface and from the REST interface. These models can come from multiple sources. The models can be based on actually the device feature sets themselves uh, and the implementation of those features natively on the device. We can also implement, and I will show you an example, of the IETF standards-based model or the RFC uh, for interfaces, uh, which is so far the most successful Yang model. It also happens to be the simplest model, but maybe that's one of the reasons we've been most successful in actually getting an agreement to implement it. But I will show you that. Uh, and we also have the ability, as Christine mentioned earlier, to support 
models that are defined by customers. So this infrastructure that we built can expose a, a wide base or wide range of features uh, defined by the actual basic device feature set and other models that will come along as, as, as time goes on. A few ad ad other additional properties of these interfaces I'll show you is it'll be possible to update these interfaces at runtime. So for example, let's say a new set of models comes out with additional capability. While the device is still running, you'll be able to actually update the interface and expose additional features that can be managed through either the NetConf or REST interface. So why don't I just go ahead into a demo. There are two parts to the demo. The first part is I will show you using the REST interface and the NetConf interface managing, uh, in this case, a CSR device. And the second part of the demo, I will show deploying a, an, a layer two VPN service across a network, uh, applying configurations to multiple devices, uh, both a successful case where we're able to deploy the service across the network. And I'll also show you an example of a device not being able to implement a particular request from the management system the device will detect that it cannot execute the required request and it will automatically roll back the previously accepted configurations. And then my simple Python application will then send single commands to the other two routers that are part of the NTAN service deployment, which will roll back those configurations too. So this is very powerful when you, when you start thinking about automation. If you have, let's say you have uh, 20 features that you need to configure properties on in order to deploy a service on a device. You'll be able to have a single NetConf or REST message to deploy all of those features in a single operation. And if any part of that configuration is rejected by the device, either the resource isn't available or you're trying to send a command to a device that doesn't support that feature, then all of the, all of the configuration that was attempted will be removed from the device. So you should not end up in a situation where you have a, a partially failed configuration and you don't know what the stat, status of your system is. So I'll go ahead now with the, uh, with the demonstration of the REST interface. So in this case, I'm using the Postman uh, plugin for Google Chrome. Very simple, very powerful application. And I'm going to start with something that's very simple. I'm going to get the host name from the device. So this is a very simple message. It's, a, it's about as simple a, a command as you can perform. And you'll see here that the host name that's configured on my particular device is CSR1K. That's pretty boring. So what I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to change the host name of the device using the REST interface. And first of all, let me show you in HTTP form this is the actual message that's going to be sent over the wire to the device. And you'll recognize the, the structure. You'll see it's a JSON encoded message. Now, because we're exposing this, this HTTP REST interface, let's say that I wanted to have a Python language binding. So one of the nice features of the Postman is it lets me show you what the language binding would look like if you wanted to change the host name of the device using Python. Let's say instead that, uh, uh, that you liked Go. Well, here's a representation using Go. So the point here is that because we have these REST-based interfaces, you can use open source tools to create language bindings. In fact, there exist some tools already. Uh, our TLF uh, group has actually already published some tools, for example, that will generate a complete set of Java APIs from the actual Yang model that's described on the device. And there are other tools like this that are starting to show up. Yeah, so I would like to just add, you know, this is one of the areas that I would say were kind of lessons learned for us. So I would say in the past, we um, kind of, you know, kind of took a little, I don't know, uh, guess or an educated guess and said, you know, we think that certain language findings are the ones that our customers will want the most. You know, we'll choose Java and Python and, you know, Ruby and kind of decide that those are the SDKs and the language findings that we'll go ahead and provide from Cisco. And in reality, you know, it's a little bit 
uh, of kind of um, you know pre uh, dictating what the customers might want to do, uh, and just saying, hey, we're only going to go ahead and choose certain language bindings and not really support the rest. And then what we've decided is we're going to take a different approach, and we're not going to be um, language binding focused anymore. We want to be able to go ahead and provide an interface that will integrate with tools that are already out there, such as Postman and other tools that basically customers and developers use already today. And those tools are very sophisticated. They could create their own language findings. And we're realizing that that's really where the industry is going. Cisco doesn't have to be the experts in creating language findings of your choice. That's something that really the customers as well as developers should choose for themselves. And that's really the direction that we're taking. Now, you know, when customers start telling us, hey, you know what, we don't really want to go ahead and do this on our own. We'd like you guys to actually provide you know, some of these kind of capabilities. You know, at that point, we're going to take that feedback. I think that's kind of some of the discussions we had in the earlier session. We're very open to taking feedback, and we're realizing that, hey, sometimes doing it once, doing it twice may not get us there. But for now, what we're seeing is that there are standards tools that are very sophisticated. These guys are doing a better job building these tools than we ever will. And we'll go ahead and rely on these tools and the sophistication in the tools to allow you to go ahead and you know, uh, uh, in integrate an, an interface to our device going forward. Okay, next thing I'll show you is I'm, I'm going to use REST. I'm going to do a query, and I'm going to query for all of the configuration that's applied to gigabit ethernet interfaces on this device. So on this particular device, I happen to have three gigabit ethernet interfaces configured at this point. And you'll see that quite well some of the properties are actually configured on the device. But what you see represented here is these are all the properties within the Yang model that actually describe the configuration of the interface feature on this iOS XE device. So for example, this happens to be the management interface. So this is the IP address that's assigned to the management interface. And you'll recognize many other properties of interfaces that are shown here that we don't happen to have a configuration for at this time. But the point is that uh, we, could create a, we can create queries to just read specific data, specific sets of data, specific properties from all of the interfaces that are on the device, anything that you can do with the, with the REST interface or NetConf is available through these interfaces. Here's an example of, of using the REST interface to actually get SNMP data from the device. So if you, if you notice here, you'll see all of the data that, that you'd recognize from the interface MIB, except it comes back in a structured data form. So we have the ability to take, actually the way we implement this is, is we download a MIB from the internet, we feed it through a tool, the tool generates the Yang model that we need to deploy on our device, we deploy that model on the device, and all of this information is now available through NetConf for REST. So literally we can, we can take and, and add SNMP data coverage for a new for, for a new MIB literally in minutes. With, we don't write any code to do this. This is all done through tooling. So you'll see all of the information is available here and again. You could query, for example, just to get in octets or whatever values that you want to receive. Here's an example of the implementation of the, of the RFC for the IETF interfaces model. Now, the ITF interfaces model is very simple. For configuration, it only has a small number of properties. So this is, this is an example of we sent a message to the device. It's defined by the standards-based model. The infrastructure on our device understands how to interpret that standards-based request, extract the data from the device, and return it in the form that the, that the ITF model is expecting. So for example, the name, which is the key in the Yang model for ITF interfaces, is a string that includes the name of the interface and some numeric identifier on the end. So our infrastructure has the ability to do the conversion between the standards-based model and the actual uh, implementation on the device. In this case, 
what I'm going to do is send a command to the device and using the IETF standards model. I'm going to add a sub-interface to Gigabit Ethernet 2. So this is the actual, this is the representation in curl. This is what the, the curl code would look like. This is the actual request that I send over the wire to the REST interface. So I'll go ahead and send that uh, to the device. And then when I read the status, hopefully the network will, uh, we've been having issues with uh, slow networks. We are a networking company, aren't we? I guess that's not going to cooperate. Well, it appears that I have lost network connectivity. Let me go to the go to the next step. So, what I was showing you here was the rest was the rest interface to the device. Well, we also expose a netconf interface from the device that's exposed by the same models. So what we have here, this is just a, a commercial product for browsing, uh, for browsing models that are implemented on a device. So this happens to be our device level model. This is the model that actually shows features that are implemented natively on the device. We expose all of these capabilities through the netconf or rest interface. So, for example, Peter, here, you, maybe, not you can everyone see the gigabit see Ethernet interface. Peter, not everyone could see it, so do you want to just explain some of the kind of features that I'm are... I'm sorry, what was that? Not everyone could see, so do you want to explain some of the features that you're showing? Oh, sure, the... yes. Yes, I will. So, for example, you'll see here we have uh, interface configuration uh, further down. So you'll see all the properties that you're familiar with configuring on interfaces. You'll see all those properties defined. Uh, as we go further down, uh, I've opened up the, the routing models. So for example, here are all the configuration properties for BGP. So all of the properties for BGP configuration that are shown here are available through either the NetConf or the REST interface on the device. From, for operational data, as I mentioned before, we have the ability to uh, to take any MIB information and return it. We also have the ability to take show command data. So today, for example, you may have CLI expect scripts and you go and you run a show command and then you parse and look for particular data. We can return data that's available that you use today in show commands. We can return that as structured data in a netconf or rest message. So that, that will also be very powerful from the standpoint of automation. Another benefit of the structured, of using the structured data and models is because the data is structured, all of the data, whether it's a netconf response or a REST response, is wrapped in tags that uniquely identify what that data is. So in the future, as new capabilities are added, let's say, to a device, or even let's say that the, the, uh, the, the internal format of, the, of, of an implementation of a command changes inside the device, the information that you receive through the NetConf or, or REST interface will be the same. You'll still be able to recognize that data. Another benefit of using the Yang modeling language is that those of us who actually develop the models, if we do it properly, then we can support backward compatibility for existing interfaces. So there are a number of ways that you extend the models that define these interfaces. If you follow those rules, let's say an application that was written against version 1.0 of, of the API implementation defined by a set of models, if you evolve the models in the correct way, then even in the future as those models change, the previous applications can still function. So backward compatibility is also enabled by using a model-based interface and the structured data that we return through, through these interfaces. Okay, great. So the next part, the next part of the demonstration is I'm going to show configuring a, a layer two VPN. 
So the, the three devices in the middle, I have a P router and two PE routers, and I have two CE routers on the end. So what I'm going to show you is using a, a Python script, and this time I'm going to use NetConf with a Python script. Though I could just as well have used REST, but I want to show you using NetConf also. I'm going to send messages. This script will send messages to configure the P router and the two PE routers to establish the L2VPN tunnel between the two CE routers, and we'll actually see the, the devices being able to successfully ping on the end. In this case, I'm doing this demonstration. I'm using ISRs. Previously, I, I was using both an ASR1K and a CSR in the other parts of this demo. So we're, we're running on several different platforms. So let me go ahead and switch to this. So what you'll see happen here is, as I run the script, in the first part of the script, you'll see here in the middle window, this is the P router. So this P router has two interfaces, one pointed to each PE router. I've configured MPLS on those interfaces. I already have OSPF running uh, uh, on these devices. And I've also configured buffered or logging buffered critical level. So now I'm going to configure the PE1 router on the upper right. So this is the actual configuration that's on the device as a result of sending this NetConf message. So you take a look at the NetConf message. This message is defined by the Yang model. NetConf requires XML encoding. So that's what you see here. So this is some of the same data that I was sending using Rust uh, to the previous interface, or to the, to, in the um, Rust example. Now when I configure the PE router, oh, click in the box. There goes our network again. Oh, there we go. Oh, I went I <laughs> too many times. Let me run this again. I had a, a lot of lag. So I'll configure the P router, the PE router, and now I'll configure the second PE router. So I just need to wait for the network to, to respond. I, I went too far. Well, once the network does respond, and configure the PE router, you'll see over on the right side, you'll actually see the ping, the ping succeed. Here we go. Did it send it? There we go. The benefits of demos and uh, doing live demos on a, on a flaky network. Next time we'll have to bring our boxes here. These are all um, routers that we're configuring over in San Jose. So there's a little bit further lag because we have to go through a VPN. Okay, one more time. Any questions, by the way, while we're waiting? <laughs> while we're waiting for this, why don't yeah, we do questions? questions. Yes. Maybe the network will get better. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, would this be supporting NetComp monitoring to allow for importing of Yang models from the device to something like Open Daylight? Yes. Yes. And then also, uh, will this be supported on iOS at any time? At this uh, time, there's no, well, do you want not, to not, not at this time. We're really um, looking to provide it on PXC platforms. We're, we hear a lot of input on the fact that it'd be nice to put this on the G2s, for example. Um, 
Yeah, we're open to hearing further feedback, but right now it's on our it's not on it's not on our immediate roadmap today. Yeah, but like on the 4400s, you'll be able to get it on um, the ESRs, you know, that are the low profile like IoT routers. You know, those are going to be running CSR, so they'll also be able to have um, these interfaces as well. Yeah, and you had a question. Yeah. Uh, Hi, I wondered if you could elucidate when you think NetConf is good to use and when REST. So, would you want me to no, come no, in on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, NetConf, uh, NetConf actually at this point is, it, it's standardized, there's an RFC, um, and there's actually interoperability testing that's being done with NetConf, and and in particular, this interface here is compliant. It's been tested to be compliant with, uh, with NetConf 1.1. REST at this point is, is still in the draft, draft stage, so there are different implementations of, of REST. Um, if, if notifications are, are important, uh, as part of the uh, NetConf currently has a standardized way of, of supporting notifications using streams, and has multiple stream capability. So this implementation can take, sys, if you choose, it can take syslog messages, um, SNMP events or notifications, and return those as NetConf notifications. On REST, I would say probably the, the biggest weakness right now of, of the REST drafts is their hand, actually their lack of handling notifications in a consistent way. So NetConf is more mature. Um, REST, you can use it. Um, and, it, and in fact, you could even use a hybrid approach with our implementation. You could use REST for configuration, and you can subscribe to NetConf notifications. You can run both interfaces at the same time. And then as REST actually comes up with a standardized way of, of implementing notifications, we'll certainly add that. Yeah, I, I mean, just to add, I would say the REST interfaces, they're not the ideal interface of choice for operational data, and that's kind of where we see the, you know, the biggest gap in terms of using the REST interface. Um, the NetConf interface is more comprehensive from that perspective, but both are, you know, it's really about choice. Uh, you know, um, these are, I'm sure, interfaces that will continue to evolve, uh, and for now, that's kind of what we're seeing in terms of the differences. So uh, the network has recovered, and you'll see here on the right, you'll see that the, the things are successful. The next part of, of the demo is I'm, I'm going to go and remove all of the configurations from all of the devices. And I just have to send a single message to each device. And what that message is, is it's a rollback message. And I was hoping that Carl Moberg would still be here because he's, I, he was going to be my live slide because it said rollback on error on his shirt, but yeah. uh, he's and not here. I would say this is one of the coolest features. It sounds kind of geeky, but the fact that you could do you know, a, a graceful rollback without you having to figure out all the steps that you took and retracing your steps in terms of those configurations, you know, in just a single step, you could just basically roll back. That's, that's basically a key feature that we're offering. So if, if you take a look here, you'll see uh, down here in the bottom, it says no cross-connect, no MPLS IP, and so forth. These are all the commands that are required to undo the configurations on each device. You, so, so you'll see there in each of the three device windows, you can see the, the, in effect, the rollback operations that were performed to actually remove the configuration from the device. So this interface also has the ability to allow you to send a NetConf RPC to checkpoint the configuration of the device or to roll back the configuration. There's a there's a, a Yang model that defines a way to actually read what the checkpoints are that are on the device. As the, as the device applies configurations, it creates rollback files for each step in the configuration. If you want to, you can connect to the device. You can get the list of rollback command, uh, rollbacks that are available. You can actually inspect each rollback and see what the reversal of a configuration would be in order to, to remove a configuration that you applied. So we're, we're thinking about trying to solve a number of the problems that, that we know are going to occur as customers move to high scale automated configuration. And the ability to detect 
fail, partially failed configurations, to roll back those configurations, to allow you to very easily create a checkpoint and go back to a, to a specific point in the configuration and do it literally in milliseconds is a very powerful capability. And we think that'll be very important as we migrate from the CLI and expect script based world to more of a progr programmatic world. Now, yeah, internally, now can we just yeah. ask, I mean, this, what do you guys think? Is that like a good feature? Like, yeah, okay, All right. Yeah, so as we're developing this implementation, we're creating uh, a number of interesting tools that we're using internally. For example, we've developed a tool that allows us to take an existing running configuration off a device, feed it into the tool, and the output of the tool are the set of netconf messages required to actually control that device. So right now it's our intent, and I've, I've discussed it with Christine, we, we're not executing on it yet, but it's our intent to publish these tools um, in open source and make them make the, these tools generally available, certainly for customers to use, but also for customers to extend. And almost all of them are Python-based, uh, pretty simple, easy to extend. So uh, we'll, we will make these, these tools available. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll end up doing that. Yeah, customers. somebody asked an Open Daylight question earlier. So as you guys know, Open Daylight is also Yang-based. Uh, model driven architecture. So they have something called the service abstraction layer. And it really has the ability to provide a service level construct kind of north of the service abstraction layer. And to the south, it speaks to the devices and it really brings in the device model of definitions from the infrastructure layers and then creates the abstraction layer above. And so that architecture is something that we really feel is the right architecture in terms of the way that we want to move forward with the devices providing these models that could be consumed by the controllers or, for example, even um, uh, NCS product that is our tail, tail F acquisition, it's been renamed the Network Service Orchestration System. Uh, that architecture is very analogous to what we've done in Open Daylight. Open Daylight is kind of our standards effort, but that's really kind of how we see as the blueprint for really the, you know, the right kind of interaction between the layers above that want to leverage our device capabilities directly, is to use the models directly. And we're also planning on, on publishing all of the models that we actually implement in our devices, making those generally available also. One benefit of that is, uh, and, and we're already doing, doing this internally, is we're using these models as, as part of our automation framework one, to generate test cases to validate our interfaces, but we're also using these models to actually generate sample configurations that, that we can apply to devices. So we plan to make, uh, also we plan to make some of our test programs that we use to actually validate the, the behavior of the interfaces available. A any other questions while yeah. we're waiting other for the Other questions? Yeah. Up front. Uh, Mike, yes. I just uh, wanted to ask about uh, authentication, if there was any plans to implement any other types of authentication into your APIs other than just using basic authentication. Are you going to allow integration with a, a PKI or yes. client certificates? Yes. And if is that currently available or is that something that will be coming in the future? Actually, I believe it's available now. I just, I don't just have, I don't have it as part of the demo, but yes, I, I'm just using basic authentication here uh, just for an example. Just, just in the demo. Yeah, all of our devices, I mean, I could give you like a whole presentation on PKI, it might be a little boring, but all of our devices have multiple layers of um, PKI infrastructure, and so what we provide in terms of our APIs are secure interfaces. Any other questions? Any other questions? Hey, thanks. So just a question on how this fits into over SDN strategy, APKM, for example. So if I'm using a Yang model, you know, my own Yang model for configuration of my network element, but also using Prime, Prime Templates or APKBM for uh, configuration, you know, which, which uh, controller is controlling a network, number one. And number two, is APKM also using Yang so it can sort of mix and match or use the same models? I, I could answer that. So what we provide from the device for APKM is uh, the NetConf and the REST interfaces. 
So APGM will use the REST interfaces likely in the near term. Um, and our key solution focus for APGM is to provide iWAN, software-defined WAN capability, where you could essentially go ahead and use your own you know, dedicated MPLS, let's say, you know, bandwidth, or use cheaper bandwidth to go ahead and offload some of the workloads on your network. So those kind of um, you know, flexibility and the way that you could go ahead and utilize the WAN network, that's what we're providing as the initial capability with, uh, with APIC-EM. That's going to be our first application that's coming out um, in the August, Ju uh, July, end of July, August timeframe. So even with that solution, we're building all the features on our devices that support all the capabilities that APIC-EM and the i1 application will need to bas basically be able to go ahead and configure you know, PFR on the device or you know, app visibility on the device. All of those things that we're going to go ahead and provide these model-driven interfaces for. And APIC-EM will consume them, in them initially through the REST interface. But there's also talk of evolving the APIC-EM and the prime architecture so that they could use the actual native Yang models, just like what I mentioned earlier with the open daylight architecture. Architecture. So it's an evolution, um, but that's that's definitely where we're looking to go. Yeah. Other Any questions? other questions? Yeah. All right. Okay. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's okay. It. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.